Okay. Very good afternoon to all of you. So thank you very much for joining with Deep Haven Counseling uh, today as we celebrate the World uh, Mental Health Day. So uh, what we'll be doing right now is we'll be having a discussion with uh, two other experts who are currently actively working in the field of mental health to specifically have a dialogue about why mental health is important, not just for anybody else, but also for mental health professionals as well. Because there needs to be a specific platform for mental health practitioners themselves to speak about their own problems. So uh, that was the main reason for doing this particular session today. So uh, before we start, let me uh, first introduce the two experts that I have here. Three experts, if you count me in as well. So uh, my name is Narayan Selvaratnam and I am a psychologist and I work at the Haven Counseling. And uh, with me, I have uh, uh, Janaka Samaravira, who is a clinical psychologist. And also I have with me uh, Mr. Samir Ali Jinnah, who is also a psychologist and also the head of the department at uh, the Global Technological Campus. So all three of us are uh, interested in assisting individuals in terms of transforming their lives uh, through deep haven counseling. And at the same time, we are very interested in uh, pushing more transparency and also getting the community in Colombo and other suburbs to understand the importance of mental health. So with that being said, let me first give a bit of an introduction as to what we do, and then we can slowly get to the Q&A session. So before we start, let me just quickly state this by saying that uh, uh, one of the reasons for having this kind of a session and also an uh, organization like the Haven Counseling is to promote the due uh, recognition the field of psychology deserves. And we firmly believe that there are multiple branches in psychology and it spreads into other interdisciplinary fields as well. So therefore that needs to be recognized and part of our initiative here is to promote psychology in all these directions as well. Uh, because we believe that psychology needs to be much more than just clinical and counseling psychology. And at the same time, uh, lots of students do get graduated in every given year in Colombo alone. And in the tertiary vocation education training sector, uh, there aren't any key core competencies that are mapped to enable someone to become an effective practitioner. So part of the work that we do here is to assist individuals to become skillful practitioners, skillful psychologists who have the understanding of how to uh, deliver their services properly to the community that they live in and to also have recognition in the trainings that they have provided. So in my opinion, I hope all of you would understand and all of you would share that uh, psychology as a field has a, a bit of a roots, its roots in the philosophy, sociology and anthropology. So we need to give that uh, rich uh, insight for students who are learning with us. But at the same time, we have to make sure they are uh, geared towards uh, becoming effective practitioners in the uh, chosen vocations. So we had to make sure the students become uh, ready and prepared to kickstart their careers. And at the same time, through this, we try to promote uh, efficacious plans for different communities other than the general community, for example, LGBTQ, uh, poverty, and other forms of at-risk populations, which is something uh, the, the government of Sri Lanka has been talking about, but not necessarily being actively doing anything. So we try to you know, do, uh, generate attention of the public and also the regulatory authorities on developing the key policies while driving research in the same area. So this is, these are some of the things that we mainly consider as part of our vision. So with that being said, uh, I would uh, first start to show a very uh, smaller video to all of you to first uh, tell you the importance of the mental health of children. Now, in any given week, we do usually get our clients. And recently we noticed that some of our clients come and say that uh, it's uh, becoming extremely difficult to work with some of their kids, mainly because kids have been uh, uh, pretty much staying in those for the last one and a half years. But at the same time, uh, they also reported a certain amount of uh, adjustment related issues in children. 
So we wanted to understand what exactly is happening here. So uh, with the help of uh, our staff at the Southern Institute of Education and Management, I actually requested two students to help me raise awareness about the importance of mental well-being in kids and in children specifically. So uh, let me first start this by showing that video to all of you. And once I uh, show you the particular video, then we could go ahead and start the Q&A session with the two experts that we have here today. Okay. Okay, let me start sharing my screen here. Okay, so this is the video and two of our students would be speaking about uh, some of their experiences. And this is mainly uh, based on, uh, uh, this is basically uh, mainly, you know, uh, narration based and not the direct experience that they are experiencing right now, but the main rationale behind this is uh, opening the uh, eyes of the public to understand more about the kind of problems students deal with. So here goes the video. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, things have changed faster than before. At first, my classmate, classmates and I have, and I were happy when we heard that schools are going to shut down for weeks and months. The government canceled the exams too. I was feeling good and confident that I would be okay. After months of lockdown, I, I started feeling the darker side of the pandemic. Although I have my more mobile phone, laptop, and television, I want my school days back. It's hard to spend time without meeting friends. I don't feel like studying sometimes, and I get really angry after hearing the bad news from the television. I think kids need some, I, I think kids need some psychology support to face this situation. If not, the upcoming generation will be full of mentally disturbed people. Thank you.
how I felt in Corona holidays. Holidays are the best time as it gives us a change to relax and explore new things. This time holidays are different because it came in lockdown period. On these Corona holidays, I have not visited any place. I spent my whole time at my house. I, I felt very lonely and sad because not having my friends. We cannot go to school because of this corona pandemic. In this vacation, I played many indoor games with my brother. I have a craft hobby, so I made many small cards with the help of internet. Not only that, I have many online classes in these days. I made many drawings. I think it was my best time pass and I really enjoyed it. I have made some without flame recipes like salad. I also helped my mother in many household works. I arranged my room properly and also managed it too. I have followed all the COVID-19 rules at my home, like drink hot water, drink hot family and then well better. During these holidays, I have taken different experiences of staying home with family and I really loved it. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that was the video that I wanted to show all of you as we start uh, this uh, particular session. The main reason is, as you have probably uh, seen in the video, is that uh, the lack of emphasis we have given so far for our uh, kids and also students, uh, especially the younger ones during this entire time. So let us, uh, let me first start this particular Q&A first by asking a question from uh, Janaka, Janaka, uh, how important do you think this kind of counseling and all for uh, kids, especially you know, to improve their mental health? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think that's a very important question uh, because uh, as uh, we all witnessed in the video, uh, as well as uh, the experiences we have, you know the almost uh, past 18 months, uh, you know, with the lockdowns and uh, the difficulties that is there. I think the children uh, uh, was one cohort of individuals 
significantly affected, uh, you know, as a result of this. Uh, also, I think uh, since uh, none of us were ready, I don't think any of us was ready for something like this. Uh, it was uh, all of a sudden and uh, definitely took a significant uh, mental health toll. And like I said, uh, sometimes uh, compared to adults, uh, children may not have the necessary components uh, equipping them to uh, you know, deal with these sort of uh, difficulties. And uh, as a result, could be uh, associated with uh, significant difficulties. And uh, these difficulties can be uh, manifested into uh, larger psychological problems uh, as we witness in the, you know, the current situation. Uh, so therefore, counseling, uh, I would say, is very important. Uh, it is extremely uh, important in helping them uh, identify their difficulties. Uh, it's an avenue, uh, not only for children, but for uh, anyone uh, of any age uh, to uh, address their difficulties, the problems, uh, the issues that they have. And uh, it's uh, nothing but a very professional, um, ethical, uh, aspect which provides uh, that uh, safe place for individuals to come and uh, uh, explore the difficulties and uh, have uh, adaptive methods of coping uh, with those. So I think uh, it's uh, very essential. Uh, uh, just adding to that, I think in Sri Lanka, it's uh, slowly expanding. We can see that uh, now uh, as of uh, 2021, uh, people are a little open-minded about it. Uh, Deep Heaven and a lot of other places are doing, uh, you know, uh, good work. And I think it's paramount, you know, on a day like this, such as the World Mental Health Day, uh, to uh, address about these in an open manner, uh, rather than being uh, close-minded about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janaka. And uh, with that, actually, you know, it, it gets me to uh, have another uh, thought uh, on its own as well, because uh, we, we talk about how these kind of services could be provided even for kids. But it raises the question uh, about the degree to which that we had to be proactive about all this process. So before we go to our uh, general q and I would like to ask from Mr. Ali what he thinks about uh, being proactive when it comes to establishing this kind of uh, mental health related uh, services. Thank you, Narayan. Um, actually, mental health services, you know how they say, it. in anything, it's better to be proactive than reactive. Because when you're doing, being reactive, you're always catching up. So the same applies to mental health. If you address a situation after it has festered and it's gotten to an extent it's really bad, it has already had an impact on the individual. Whereas if you act proactively, you will help them uh, cope better. And therefore, uh, reduce the impact that it has, the effect has had on their mental health. So always uh, proactive is definitely better than uh, reactive. But in terms of the COVID outbreak, like Mr. Janathan mentioned, it caught us up off guard, especially in Sri Lanka as well, because it happened very suddenly, the lockdowns happened very suddenly, and it was quite prolonged. And because we hadn't seen something like this, uh, something that this, this disruptive to the society, it uh, we weren't really aware of the deep seated impact that comes with it. So that made us uh, not, I guess, in the, at least in the beginning, not uh, adapt effectively. And uh, but it was more of a reactive situation when we, how we dealt with it, not just in the mental health industry, but pretty much everything from the medical industry to education industry, to pretty much everything. So all of that contributed to making it essentially a bit of a, a serious situation, not just for the kids, but also for the adults as well. And while uh, we have that experience now, I think it's time to put into place uh, reactive, uh, sorry, pro proactive measures that can actually help us identify. So for example, teachers um, now know what to look out for 
because from the experience working with uh, the children, they have been uh, more exposed to this. So they are aware when a child is being, um, um, for example, not as uh, involved in the classroom, whereas previously the child has been very active. So they tend to notice those changes and they tend to pick up on those the issues. So once they pick up on this, now we can we are in a position where they are able to pick up those signs, not just uh, from um, the work, how they work, but also the subtle cues. And maybe that will help us have a more reactive, a more proactive approach to this than a reactive one. Thank you very Thank much. You and uh, and uh, with that, it, it, it gets me to, you know, like ask about this as well. Now, earlier we have seen that when someone deals with a psychological problem, the particular person is getting the required assistance. But now with the existing COVID restrictions and everything, I have noticed a particular trend where sometimes the entire family is collectively dealing with psychological issues. So, for example, first the, let's say the mother or the father goes through a particular problem, could be an adjustment related issue or could be, you know, intrusive thoughts or obsessive uh, thoughts about something bad is going to happen. But then when the restrictions are going on, the kid this entire time, you know, inside the house witnessing all of this and they are much more vulnerable to have, you know, major problems later as well. So this is a bit of a thing that we have observed. But then as we try our best to help every family and every other individual in the community who is dealing with this kind of these things, it also raises the question, you know, how good are we in terms of getting ourselves in the right track? Because most of the clients who seek our assistance also experience significant other problems in their jobs as well. And then these particular issues are pretty much multifaceted in the sense the more I try to address a particular problem, the person kind of, you know, goes through some other issues as well. So simultaneously, all these things need to be addressed. So my, my question to uh, Mr. Janaka is, why do you think mental distress affect their jobs and other various other career related aspects of their life? Just to begin our conversation. Yeah, right. yeah. as you very correctly pointed out, uh... If you take the um, World Health Organization's, uh, you know, the definition uh, of uh, the concept of well-being, the concept of health, uh, when, when they talk about, uh, you know, such pivotal aspects, and these things are uh, important to everyone, regardless of what age you are or what category of the society that you live in. Uh, the, the World Health Organization, WHO, now it's a very popular these days, you know, with all the uh, policy making and uh, the decision making that they do. So I thought I'd be good to quote that. Um, they say, uh, when, you, when you talk about this overall aspect of the health, the well-being uh, focus, uh, they encompass uh, both physical and psychological aspects. So similarly, uh, that is unique, that applies uniquely to the health aspect as well. And uh, we know uh, the mind-body connection uh, that is there. And uh, as the saying goes, uh, healthy body, healthy mind. So uh, we need to know this, uh, that it is a reciprocal connection. And uh, none of us, no matter uh, which point in life we are, uh, able to run away from these truths, you know, in, in life. So therefore, uh, we need to, uh, I think, understand these things. And uh, the second uh, aspect is uh, accept uh, these things and uh, use uh, appropriate mechanisms, or like I previously said, uh, adaptive uh, methods of coping uh, and dealing with these because uh, at the end of the day, these are uh, inevitable things in life uh, when, it, when we talk about the health aspect. So, uh, like I said, these uh, it's very good to incorporate uh, mental health aspects because a lot of people uh, they take care of their they take care of their body, they take care of their skin. Mm? Uh, you we know all these products that is there. It's very popular. Are very marketing aspects, uh, but but here 
us. But, but the thing is, uh, the, the mind is equally important. But unfortunately, a lot of individuals uh, don't realize that, you know. Uh, I have a feeling it is largely, uh, I'm not talking only with regards to Sri Lankan perspective. I'm talking from an overall perspective. Um, a lot of the people, I think, uh, undervalue the uh, aspect of uh, uh, mental health, uh, aspect of their uh, overall well-being. So, like I said, uh, mental, physical, uh, both aspects uh, play a uh, equal part. Uh, they are equivocal uh, in this uh, uh, scenario. Uh, so, therefore, I think uh, being aware, uh, being insightful uh, uh, about these things at a younger age, is always good. And uh, that is where I think a lot of the focus should be, especially again on a day like this. I think that's where the awareness should be uh, in terms of individuals uh, to uh, put this to the society uh, so that individuals understand uh, uh, that the uh, mental well being is also equally uh, valuable. Uh, just like having a uh, nice hair or having nice skin uh, or uh, you know beautiful clothes and things like that so uh, we need to be able to understand the moment we understand that the moment we are uh, aware of this uh, i think that will give a lot of avenue uh, for individuals in the general society to uh, view this uh, in a much more uh, positive uh, brighter uh, vibe and that indeed can, uh, you know, change things uh, in a positive direction. Uh, and I think we are already uh, doing things and taking steps to do that. And uh, it's, it's a matter of uh, continuing that moving forward. Thank you, Janaka. I think what you said is very correct because now we understand that mental health has become something really important to be considered, I think, because of the existing COVID-related uh, things have made us realize that it is important more than ever. Now, with that, let me uh, focus on uh, this. Uh, let me put this question again to uh, Mr. Ali. Uh, what do you think now? These problems doesn't come alone. It, it feels like, you know, the disorders that we mostly say are pretty much like syndromes in some sense because you see multiple layers to it. Could be affecting the job, could be affecting the family, could be affecting, you know, like a lot of other things and all that. So, why do you think these kind of things are, you know, becoming much more commonplace these days? Thank you, Narayan. Yeah. Um, actually, yes, whenever you have some kind of uh, disorder or some kind of issue, mental health issue, you see its effect throughout your, uh, the, throughout the various aspects of your, uh, um, your career or your life, your relationships. The reason is because the common denominator there is you, the individual. So whatever interaction that he has with people or with his work, with his peers, you know, whatever work he does, it impacts all of them. So the severity of the issue uh, relates to how deep-seated the impact is. So for example, if someone who is going through very minor, uh, say for example, um, trust issues. So that would have a very limited impact because that trust issue would have a specific focus. For example, he has trust issues over authority, or then he might ask, start asking the question if he walks somewhere and goes, oh, you need, now you need to sign in. You need to sign in with your name, telephone number, your ID number everywhere, wherever you go. So then if he has a trust issue, and especially with this with authority, um, he'll be like, oh, everybody's tracking me. So he will not want to do that, or he or she will not want to do that. So that is a specific issue. But when you have deeper, much more serious issues that can actually uh, encompass different areas, for example, depression, one of the most common ones, stress, another one. So one of the, those are very common ones. So the stress, it's not very selective. It's actually much more, um, uh, much more deep-seated and it impacts all the different facets or all the different aspects of uh, a person's uh, life and interaction. So when a person is going through severe stress, irrespective of what interaction he has, that, that stress and depression will be visible. Some people are better at it uh, for uh, 
um, hiding it, so to speak, putting on a brave face or when it comes to depression, or when it comes to stress, they uh, compartmentalize. So one of the things they do is they um, bury the stress and they just focus on the short term effects. But even then you can see subtle differences. So if it's a person who knows the individual very well, they'll pick up on those. So likewise, the impact, like I said, it's not actually limited to a specific scenario cases where the issue is much more deep seated. So how, the question of how you actually uh, address that, that is the, the question there. So uh, that would actually base, be based on the individual. So the individual needs to recognize, first of all, before you try to give any sort of uh, therapeutic practice towards uh, rectifying it. So that they have an issue there. And some, a lot of the times they don't actually see that impact. So let me give you an example. When a person has high levels of stress, they tend to react uh, very fast. Sometimes angrily, sometimes aggressively, sometimes they get offended very easily. So the first step is for them to recognize that there is an issue there. And most often, one of the biggest issues there is that it doesn't get recognized because they usually push the issue onto the others. Uh, for example, let's say, for example, he's uh, a person is walking down the uh, road and then someone just cuts across. Okay, when he's trying to cross the road, someone just goes across and, uh, without stopping or without slowing down, or intentionally increasing the speed of the vehicle. Normally, what the reaction would be is uh, to get angry. But then, if the person is stressed and he starts uh, picking a fight or trying to throw curse words at the person who just walked by or run, try and drive by and say, for example, he's also stressed and they, they gets into a conflict situation. When it gets into a conflict situation, it's escalating there. So how do you actually address those kinds of situations is another question. Recognizing is the first step and then addressing it is the second step. To address, there are multiple ways of addressing. You can actually address it using uh, being more self-aware of yourself and addressing uh, addressing the core, core uh, needs, for example, your own self-awareness and your empathic skills and also being uh, more in control of your emotions. So those will help, but up to a certain point and you can also rely on your support structure, uh, your family, your peers, your uh, spouses or your partners, etc. So those all, all of those will help help towards that. But after a certain point, it gets to the stage that it, you need to actually, uh, you might need to actually uh, refer to a much a professional who can actually help you. And in that case, uh, you need to go see someone. Okay, so that is also one. And like in your video, you mentioned that some in some cases, just seeing a psychologist might not be sufficient. You might need to actually consult a, a, a psychiatrist or a, a doctor who would be actually able to prescribe medication. For example, in severe cases of depression, you can't even get the person engaged in a conversation to actually help them. So in those situations, you need medical intervention to actually get that started. So I hope that makes it it's clear the different stages and how it goes and uh, so on. Yes, thank you very much, Ali, because I think I, I, I like the fact that you actually talked about this because now we have now so far just a few members. The first one is being proactive, but at the same time, having understanding the complexity in the problems that we get. So when we learn as psychology students many years ago, we usually focus on a specific disorder as this, okay, this, this disorder, this exactly how we go to do it. But now when you are in the clinic and when you are working with the people, it uh, comes to our understanding that these things are getting much more complicated and there are added players now. The fact that all three of us are educators on top of being, you know, psychologists. Now, the next question is actually twofold. The first thing is now, I have observed that the corona had uh, kind of elicited a larger set of unique issues mainly could be related to technology or could be related to uh, the overall restrictions and all that. So my next question to Mr. Janaka is that, do you think that there are unique issues, psychological problems that occur because of this 
COVID-19 related problems and how has that affected the overall you know, education sphere? Um, I think uh, the psychological problems, uh, uh, I, the clinically diagnosable aspect I'm talking about uh, has always been there. It, it's part and parcel of society, you know, uh, because of the uh, stress factors, uh, uh, like I mentioned, uh, maladaptive coping methods, uh, lack of uh, awareness, uh, lack of insight about things, you know, things like that. So, uh, but the thing is, um, uh, like you correctly mentioned, uh, the, the unprecedented uh, COVID situation, uh, I believe, uh, has uh, what we call uh, uh, acted as a, a very significant trigger. I think that's uh, a very good way of uh, looking at this. Uh, uh, the, another very important keyword there, I think, is the uh, it's unprecedented. It's something new and uh, something which we have uh, you know, not uh, been very um, uh, much heard of. Although we've seen in our history books about uh, you know, pandemics and the uh, Spanish flu and uh, you know, other things, uh, no one has really uh, witnessed this uh, firsthand. So, so when that happened, uh, I think uh, the, the psychological resources, uh, the reservoirs which we uh, as individuals have, uh, probably uh, was not strong enough uh, to deal with this. And like I said, the stress factors and things are inevitable. It's always there. Huh? Uh, before, like if you take a country like Sri Lanka, for example, uh, I'm taking local examples so that it can be applicable to everyone. Uh, if you take Sri Lanka, if you take children's life, I I'm taking a very simple example. I'm very sure majority of uh, us uh, can relate to this. Uh, school has always been a stressful place uh, because of the competitive nature, uh, because of the uh, lack of support. Now, if you take a look at uh, uh, students, uh, the aspects like uh, jealousy, uh, aspects like uh, 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 non-acceptance are starting as small as grade three, four, when they prepare for the scholarship exam. And they may be manifested by the household, maybe parents, uh, could be various reasons. But, but these things get instilled at quite a young age. Uh, so I think because of that, uh, then it only continues and escalates from there, you see. I'm very sure a lot of you can, uh, uh, you know, be, uh, I mean, uh, relate to this. And then it doesn't stop there. It comes to the ordinary level exam, it becomes more competitive. Then comes the advanced level exam. We think, okay, I've passed this and you know, I can be happy, not really. You know, then come other challenges. Uh, so uh, because we live in this rat race uh, in, in our, it's, it's a uh, you know, uh, issue with the education system, sadly. Uh, like Naren mentioned, all three of us are in this field. Uh, we know this. Uh, I've been a senior lecturer for at least now seven years. So uh, when you talk about these aspects, uh, it's very sad because uh, ultimately, uh, without us knowingly, uh, uh, it's it's the child, it's the individual who, uh, who who diminishes, you know, as a result of these things. So when they become an adult, when they become an adult, uh, uh, they are already, uh, to quote Martin Seligman, um, in a state of helplessness uh, on their own. So when that happens, when that happens, uh, when uh, then further triggered by other uh, difficult situations, and also not to forget the COVID situation that we are currently in, the significant trigger uh, that happened, uh, like I said, roughly maybe 18, 20 months back, uh, uh, we were found uh, vulnerable uh, as a result, uh, not only uh, led to uh, you know, uh, smaller problems, but individuals who may have had, you know, minor difficulties, uh, individuals who may have had uh, small aspects of uh, anxiety or uh, uh, aspects of trauma, uh, this uh, escalated it to a different level and uh, manifested into uh, bigger disorders uh, and bigger problems. So you are uh, absolutely correct. Uh, uh, the COVID situation has definitely uh, triggered uh, as well as uh, maintained 
a lot of difficulties and uh, from my uh, personal uh, you know work uh, the clinical practice uh, also my discussion with students and you know things even research aspect for that a uh, lot of the time uh, these individuals are like i said are not ready and also they have uh, uh, added other burdens uh, as a result of this so uh, therefore uh, making it worse and that can like i said manifest into uh, bigger psychological problems or even uh, more severe uh, psychiatric issues uh, such as psychotic disorders because we know from the psychopathology uh, that uh, you know things like uh, clinical depression long term clinical depression uh, chronic depression um, uh, also aspects of uh, for example ocd obsessive compulsive disorder quite common these days uh, uh, it's it's very common. Uh, a textbook would say you know the prevalence rates about two to five percent. Not really. When you actually fall into the real society, uh, there is a lot of individuals who fall into that category. And psychopathologically speaking, it's one disorder that uh, uh, can manifest into psychosis later on. You know, uh, so uh, those problems, uh, clinical depression aspects, severe. It can turn from moderate to severe in no time. So. COVID situation definitely triggers and maintains this. And also, I think uh, very appropriately, I can tell that these days it has uh, uh, manifested addiction problems uh, in individuals as well, especially children who are spending most of their day uh, uh, stuck uh, in the home and uh, doing most of their education online. Uh, they, they, they unfortunately fall into that addiction bracket and we know from neuronal pathways in the brain, uh, our brain is uh, very susceptible to those reward aspects and uh, ultimately can lead to uh, severe problems. So to answer your question, uh, COVID definitely has made things uh, more difficult uh, because of the aforementioned factors I told. Yeah, thank you very much, Jarekar. So I think adding on to the same elements that we discussed uh, prior to you know this particular question, so it is very clear that most of the things uh, that are resulting because of the COVID-19 the psychological issues, they are being translating into other domains of life at a greater veracity. It is something that we can directly observe. So uh, let me ask you, Ms. Nadi, do you have anything to add to the same question that we have been discussing about how these kind of uh, problems have become unique because of the existing restrictions of the COVID and how it has affected the uh, education sector in general? Uh, yes, no, much like what uh, Mr. Janaka said, it's, I wouldn't say it's unique, it's all issues that's been there, but it's kind of like, uh, um, how do you say, mutated, you could say. Those issues are there, but it's the, the implications and how it is manifested is slightly different given the special, uh, um, how do you say, the measures, the special way that we've gone through, like for example, the issues of isolations that we are having, and especially with children, uh, you see, because of the isolation and they being stuck at home, not being able to have social interactions, that has had a significant impact, like with the, what Mr. Janaka said on their social skills. And also, um, Mr. Janaka also mentioned about uh, acceptance and how people, the, the, the children are being as little as grade three, you can see them having issues with uh, other, ch other children. So those social skills are kind of, uh, even before COVID, we, have, we started seeing those uh, social skills depreciating and issues related to that. But with COVID now, it has grown drastically. Um, and it's just going to get worse, especially the younger kids now who are currently, who have been going through uh, the social skills development completely from home. They haven't had very little interaction with other peers, and they've had very little opportunity to uh, play and work and study with their uh, with peers, and that has will have a significant impact in the long run, and uh, in the long run as they develop. And it it is we are going to be seeing a lot more. And going back to your initial question of uh, should we be proactive or reactive? Now that we understand how the implications will be there. And how, now that we've seen some of the short-term implications, we can actually extrapolate that 
and expect a much bigger impact in the long run. And we need to start planning how we are going to address those issues that is definitely going to be there in this social skills through online platforms. Uh, I'm getting a message saying my connection is unstable. I hope I, you can all hear me. Okay, so yeah, so you can see that uh, that issue, it, it will, it, it is something that you're going to see in the long run. And this is one area that we can actually start addressing right now, improving their social skills, reducing, uh, reducing, at, 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 what I would say is reducing their dependency on the technology, but right now it's not possible because that is the only way we, we are moving forward at the moment. But then we need to think about how we can actually build the social skills that they would require. Uh, and some, some of the things you'll see is when you talk about kids as young as three years old, they need tactile input and that will help their development. And that is a significant issue now because they don't get to go out. They don't get to play even outside in the garden, uh, in this, in the, playing with the uh, sand, playing with the plants, just being outside in the open air. And uh, even those will have a, a good learning experience. I'm sure uh, Ms. Janet can elaborate a bit more on that as well uh, with his experience. But yeah, so that, that's the impact that it has had on the younger generation that I'm talking about. If you take into consideration the older generation, you can see, uh, for example, the uh, people who are currently working now, you can see that they've had some struggles uh, in terms of adapting to working through using technology. Um, it's hard to have a meeting when you don't sit right in front of the other person. So you can see some of them have adapted well, have uh, taken up the challenge and then adapted to it, but then some are still struggling. Normally, what I would say is when you have a, a I guess the normal saying would be in uh, psychology, whenever you have a, a drastic change, it's going to impact your life and that's going to impact your, have a significant impact on your mental well-being and your, and your uh, adaptability uh, will have a direct impact on how well you deal with it. So the COVID issue is specifically had a drastic impact on how they live their life, how they interact in multiple facets, like you said, Mr. Narayan. Uh, multiple facets of their social and uh, uh, psychological, physical well-being. Um, so that impact uh, not only has it, uh, you, you not only has it been visible in the younger generation and the older generation, but there is confidence there as well. There is impact in terms of uh, social interaction. In, in some ways, you can say the older generation are more impacted by the fact that they uh, have less uh, opportunities for socializing when throughout most of their life, they've been very social people. And you can see the middle generation. I would say that the middle generation would be, uh, the, uh, would be the people who are more comfortable with both the technology and social skills, um, um, both technology and physical interaction. So even they have been impacted. The, the fact that they uh, are unable to actually uh, have been unable for months to go out and interact and they're talking to the same people and individuals, that has, a, uh, that, that has an impact on their uh, psychological and mental well-being. And um, that kind of isolation does bring out the, the issues that they've had that are, uh, I would say, uh, small, the small issues that they've had, the slight stresses or slight depression, it exacerbates it. It makes it much more worse and you can see it has a bigger deep-seated impact. I hope that clarifies a little bit. And also, if you want me to talk about uh, the impact on education in terms of how the delivery of uh, delivery mechanism of learning has been impacted. If you look at it from that, that perspective as a teacher or an assessor, an educator, uh, might I say, yeah, from that perspective, we've had significant issues in terms of um, delivering the uh, the, the teaching, we, we have had issues where uh, if we were normally in a classroom, we would depend on nonverbal cues. For example, a, a student speaking up or um, just by looking at a student, you can actually tell if they understood. They don't need to ask and say that, uh, can you clarify this? So 
those cues have, have kind of disappeared now, now that we are all online. Um, it's not as apparent as it used to be before. So that has had an impact in both the teacher, uh, the educators, uh, uh, I guess, efficacy in delivering their learning, uh, but also the students' understanding and learning. And especially if we have kids who are or learners who are um, not as vocal, then they need to ask the questions that they don't understand, etc. They, they are the ones who will be impacted the most in this. And, and not just from the teaching and education side, but also from the assessment side, we've been impacted because we can't have any exams. We can't have any sort of assessments that would require them to be in a, a room together. So we've had issues there as well. So most of the uh, one thing, either uh, the institutions that are in Sri Lanka, social distance and somehow the other do the physical session, physical assessments, or they adapted to doing the session uh, the assessments online. So at Global Technology Campus, we are actually doing um, a blend of the two. We've been experiment with, experimenting with uh, doing uh, online examinations as well. And it has its own set of issues. For example, um, how do you, uh, from a regulatory perspective, how do you actually ensure that the students is not cheating, for example? Um, do we can't ask the students to share their screens because then the other students will be able to see it. Uh, but we can actually have their cameras on and ensure that they're not talking to anybody, they're not uh, referring to their phones, etc. So from the regulatory perspective as well, and the politicians perspective, we have issues there as well in terms of how do we ensure the, the examinations are fair and it's uh, uh, equal to all. So we've had issues in that aspect as well. I hope that has brought some clarity. If you have any further follow-up questions, please do ask. Yes, um, thank you very much, Mr. Ali. So I think what you said actually got me to think about two things. Now, two of the words that I picked from what you said was, you know, exacerbation and efficacy. Now, one of the perks of being a psychologist and also an educator is that you get to meet a great deal of people every day. Uh, in the work that you do. And all of us have probably met thousands of students so far during our careers. Now, one thing that I have noticed right now is that every person who walks into the clinic, every person who walks into the classroom, they are hardworking people. In Sri Lanka specifically, being a developing country, people are hardworking. You have put much effort compared to a person in the Midwest in the United States. Now, but the thing is that, that hardworking nature and the efforts that you have and the beliefs that you have about yourself doesn't necessarily seem to be equally available when you put 20 people together in a room and ask them to, you know, make the system change. So collectively, there seems to be a major dearth or a deficit in that kind of efficacy belief. So self beliefs about being able to success. Now, my question to Mr. Janaka is, do you think this kind of uh, deficits in self-beliefs about you know, efficacy has a major, uh, uh, has become a major contributor towards you know, mental health problems in Sri Lanka? And do you think this kind of behaviors in the society kind of affects the practitioner as well to a certain degree? Um, I think Naren, uh... Yeah, I, I would like to look at that uh, primarily from uh, two areas. Uh, like you uh, said, the example, I would like to elaborate a bit on that example that you mentioned. Um, now, in the Sri Lankan context, um, again, I would like to come back to that, the, the education aspect that I spoke of earlier, uh, and also uh, amalgamate culture to this as well. So, um, as you know, uh, Sri Lanka, the Asian context, uh, this is a collectivist culture uh, compared to the individualistic cultures that are seen in the United States or the, you know, the Western context. So, this cultural paradigm can bring a significant shift in the way people think in the way people uh, do things, uh, in the way uh, individuals would uh, react. And uh, like you correctly uh, mentioned, uh, it would bring about significant differences in how they do things. And psychologically speaking, uh, I think it directly, directly or 
indirectly uh, impacts your uh, uh, self view, self view, uh, self esteem, self efficacy. Uh, those different things, uh, those different concepts. And this is the factor that we see that uh, our individuals also don't forget from, from uh, the, the preschool, from the, from the grade ones, primary classes are, um, you know, uh, in that rat race and always taught uh, to, you know, do things, uh, you know, for you, do things for you, uh, not do things for others. So that coming back to your specific example, that's why I told, I will combine uh, education and the cultural aspect. And you, as you know, uh, as someone who has uh, uh, studied uh, in the United States, uh, that uh, you do not see that uh, mental picture. You do not see that uh, physical picture uh, in, in, in a classroom, uh, in the societal aspects uh, in, in the U United States of America or, or other Western countries for that matter. So because of that, I think it's a huge deficit. It's a huge deficit. And it also creates a, a lot of uh, difficulty in collaboration. That's why you see a lot of the Sri Lankan struggle, you know, when it comes to the group situation, when it comes to collaborations, when it comes to uh, sharing ideas with other people, they're very good themselves, you know. Uh, for example, I'll give a very simple example. Uh, someone, uh, you know, uh, it's very common for individuals to get uh, eight A's or nine A's or, so, you know, so many number of A's for their ordinary level exam, for example, or their advanced level exam, of course, lesser the number of subjects, uh, but uh, they might not be able to translate that, the, the, the knowledge aspect when it comes to practice. So they might not be able to uh, face, uh, uh, face an interview. Well, uh, even, even going to the university, we uh, see ample times uh, I worked in a couple of the state universities in Sri Lanka at the capacity of a lecturer. Uh, in both, what I have seen is that the, although, and you know, no one comes to state universities with like two C's or S or something like that, they, they get absolutely excellent results. Uh, this is the cream of the, uh, the you know, the uh, individuals who sit for the Sri Lankan A-levels, uh, but they cannot sometimes translate that in a lecture or a tutorial situation. This is the deficit that I'm talking about because we are we may be you know competent as individuals, but if you cannot translate that uh, in in a group setting, uh, in a collaborative setting, if if I cannot work together with someone else, uh, you know, in the in the work context, because we we are you know designed to be social beings. We cannot be, you know, hiding in a room and, you know, doing things ourselves. That's not possible on planet Earth. So therefore, uh, that is, like I mentioned, a amalgamation of the culture, uh, the, the things that are taught to us sometimes, very, very unfortunately. And the, the, the uh, I, I would, I would uh, without a hesitancy, use this word, the failure of the education system, that rat race system that we are accustomed to uh, is is causing these difficulties for these students because ample times I've seen just two days back, a student, a child who came in nine years, but is struggling in the work context, is struggling in the, uh, cannot face an interview and things like that. So this is what I'm talking about because book knowledge doesn't necessarily, doesn't, does not, necessarily translate, uh, you know, how efficacious you are. That's where I brought in the concept of in the self, uh, then self-esteem, self-efficacy, because we can have sometimes, you know, very high self-esteem, but efficacy is actually doing it. How efficacious you are as an individual. And unfortunately, in the cultural uh, perspective, as well as the, uh, the, the uh, poor educational structure, uh, I, I believe, has led uh, to these uh, difficulties for majority of the individuals. Uh, of course, I'm talking about the majority. And because if we are to succeed, if the country is to succeed, there's two things that need to change, according to my perspective. Uh, you need to minimize brain drain in Sri Lanka, and you need to uh, uplift 
the education system uh, to the standards of uh, uh, you know more developed countries uh, without that happening and also the mindset the close mindset of a lot of sri lankan individuals uh, without that because that gets manifested from the parent or the teacher or the uh, uh, the relatives uh, to the child and the child is the one who who uh, builds or brings the country forward so when that doesn't happen when these factors uh, doesn't combine together uh, unfortunately uh, we will forever be stuck you know in that developing stage or perhaps go down uh, the road and uh, you know might not see anything positive but see a bunch of people who are not uh, competent who are not skilled uh, you know to deal with uh, the everyday situations the work the job which ultimately would open the doors for other people and uh, it's a very very sad situation if we don't address and that is where i think mental health professionals uh, and as well as educators have a pivotal role to i think now is the high time you know to address these things uh, to to change the viewpoint uh, of individuals uh, to understand that uh, if we are too late, uh, it might be a bit difficult moving forward. Thank you very much, Janaka. So I think one of the key things that I was able to grasp from what you said was, you know, culmination of these kind of beliefs of efficacy. So that is, of course, is a factor of greater salience in the entire education system of Sri Lanka. Now, with that being said, now, uh, let me ask this question, you know, because now uh, it, 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 when we see how exactly these things, you know, turn out, it, it seems that the average Sri Lankan, if they lack this particular, you know, uh, uh, understanding of being able to successfully venture into the job market or maybe, you know, whatever the other domains in the life, the therapist himself or herself is also a product of the same average person that we are talking about. So my question to Mr. Ali now is that, what do you think about the therapist in this same context? When we talk about you know lack of self-beliefs of ethics, do you think the therapist these days, considering the kind of uh, uh, chaos or turbulence we are experiencing right now, do you think this lack of efficacy has affected or impacted the average therapist or the psychotherapist that we would find in this country? Short answer, definitely. The long answer is a bit more complicated because there's a lot of factors involved in this. Um, in short, like I said, there is definitely an impact, but it also depends on how adaptable a person is and how much they've uh, integrated. Like, for example, their technological skills will have a direct impact on how well they've uh, uh, transformed or transferred. So a person, uh, let me give you an example. For a person who is exclusively doing um, face-to-face -face, uh, counseling sessions um, and who is not very tech savvy. Um, he doesn't or she doesn't use technology much or is not aware of technology much in, and it's uh, not very familiar with it, will have a bit of a difficulty transferring on, um, uh, transferring or translating that uh, service that they've been providing into, a, um, 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 into an online platform, which is what all, pretty much all the therapists are doing right now. So uh, while that issue is there, there is also the issue of um, uh, that every one of us have gone through. I'm sure Mr. Narayan, you yourself and Mr. Jamaki, you've gone through this. Um, now that we are doing exclusively or primarily um, online sessions, online counseling sessions, you've seen that uh, some of the issues that we mentioned that uh, we come across with education as well are also prevalent there. You tend to miss out on a lot of cues, uh, the nonverbal cues, even if the video is available, just the, uh, for example, the position of the leg or a slight eyebrow raise or the slight minor cues that you pick up on is missed because of uh, the quality of the video. And not just that, not just missing those cues, but also the connection qualities issues also there in Sri Lanka, especially in Sri Lanka, you, I've experienced myself um, when I'm teaching or you know, when I'm doing, having it in the middle of a counseling session, I have drops in internet connection, connectivity, and that has an impact. Uh, like 
it disrupts the flow of a conversation. So when we are having a, when a, a, a client is actually um, um, pouring their heart out and uh, in the middle of it, if it just cuts out, your connection just drops and you go, um, sorry, I missed that. Could you repeat that again? That it kills the mood completely. And the, 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 the information that was coming out from the, the client, it's gone because it changes the person's mindset and uh, the, 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 the feelings that the person was going through while he was saying, it disrupts that. When that disruption happens, it impacts, it has a significant impact on how much information you can get across as well. And also when it comes to new clients that we've been seeing uh, exclusively through the online platform, uh, a rapport building is another issue, uh, which is one of the core fundamentals that we need to establish in any sort of uh, uh, interaction. And building rapport over the uh, through an online platform is also a bit more difficult, uh, especially given some of the negative connotations that Sri Lankans have with uh, not being able to see things. Like even if you look at it from the, the consumer perspective, um, Sri Lanka has suffered greatly. You know, online sales have not actually been successful in Sri Lanka. Um, online advertising not very successful in Sri Lanka because of our mentality and the actual fact that uh, we have substandard products that are being sold online. And that mentality that we have, we don't trust most of the things that come to us from an uh, online platform. So um, given that issue, I would say, um, yes, there is a significant impact. Yes, it has. Uh, had uh, deep sea, deep uh, uh, issues, deep issues with uh, how we actually approach this. And not just from a, a therapist perspective, but also from a client perspective, if you look at it from a client perspective, uh, they might not have, uh, they might not be satisfied because they also rely quite a bit on uh, whether they are doing it knowingly or unknowingly, uh, as, as, as my, uh, from uh, the therapist or at the right time or uh, a, a cue from the therapist to essentially um, uh, re, uh, reaffirming their uh, position will be very effective in uh, helping them feel calmer. And when we have issues with in internet connectivity plus also uh, uh, the ability to pick up those cues is somewhat hindered because we are now in an online uh, platform to actually deliver this. In addition to that, I also want to add a little bit of uh, points on uh, which Mr. Janaka was uh, mentioning. He mentioned that uh, uh, EQ skills and uh, IQ skills are somewhat lacking in uh, some of the people who are going into the uh, education sector, uh, into the working uh, sector at the moment. Uh, while they have quite a strong um, academic background, they kind of somewhat lack the uh, the skills, interpersonal skills and uh, uh, EQ, IQ skills that is required for them to be successful in the workplace. And that is a very important point that it's kind of like my pet peeves, if you may, uh, that I keep harping on about, uh, in, especially in terms of education. Uh, and I think it's primarily because of our education system and what we focus on. We uh, give a lot of importance and credibility to just simple knowledge. And they, we don't focus on the additional skills that is required to actually move ahead in life. Um, for example, if you look at from the Western, Western perspective, they have finishing schools uh, about uh, how to behave, uh, how to behave uh, in certain situations. And we don't have any of those that is actually included in our curriculum. Our curriculum is completely knowledge based. Um, and so we need to focus a little bit more on EQ and IQ skills, interpersonal skills, uh, and we need to focus, even when you, it comes to knowledge, we need to ensure, this is something that I keep repeating, especially at uh, uh, university level, uh, undergraduate and uh, postgraduate levels, we need to move away from essentially just regurgitating knowledge, regurgitating something that you learned and actually focus on evaluatory skills analytical skill, because that will actually equip you better in terms of, in the, in the long run, in, in terms of how you apply it. I would say those are the transferable skills that you will actually gain from uh, uh, education that you can actually apply in any context in a workplace. 
For example, if you are asked to write a report, having the knowledge on how to write the report would be very beneficial and how to actually analyze things. So that is, I think, that is one of the reasons why psychology is a very, uh, a very famous degree to study, actually, because it has a lot of transferable skills that you can actually apply in any working context. And just because you study psychology doesn't mean you need to be a therapist. You can actually go into a vast area of uh, workforce, into the workforce. And irrespective of where you go, the skills that you learn, the, the skills that you learn and the uh, analytic, especially the analytical skills, the interpersonal skills, those will, can be applied in a very, very effective manner to actually help you move forward in your career. So I think just for that sake alone, it's very important that uh, we in, implement some sort of, uh, at least to a certain degree, implement uh, EQ, IQ skills and interpersonal skills in the curriculum from a younger age, I would say. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Ali. And uh, now, now with that, you know, with what uh, both of you said, if we just structure, you know, the entire Q and A session today. So, if we divide it into three separate pieces. So, at at first, we started discussing the general psychological problems people face, and then from there, we moved to the education sector to understand how important it is to impart this knowledge and also key skills and competencies into the general school curriculum and all that, and how thereby, you know, we could uh, generate effective therapists. Now with that, I need to make a bit of a shift from, you know, uh, what we were discussing. We want to discuss about now the therapist, the person that we are uh, mainly, you know, interested in understanding mostly about now. One of the things that I have noticed is that as we keep on doing all of this, now certain days I would be doing counseling to a client while myself I'm being stuck at home. So the person might say, okay, look, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. And I'm telling him, you know, how to cope up with that and what kind of things need to be done. But at the same time, fully knowing the fact that, you know, I also go through the same issue. I know that I have the same issue. And sometimes I may have a hard time, you know, uh, 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 coping up with that as well. So now the question is, how important are support groups and all these kind of things for therapists? Because we obviously are not immune to problems. We go through problems as well as general individuals, as people in the society, very common. What kind of platforms are there right now to help therapists cope up as well? Because obviously when you listen to too much of you know stories or things from outside is it's going to take a toll on one's own self. So, uh, so my question to Mr. Janaka is, uh, how important do you think support groups and these kind of things for therapists? Yeah, that's a very important question. I think uh, am I clear to everyone? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's an excellent question because I think it would be uh, very valuable uh, for the uh, participants here, especially if there are students who are hoping to uh, you know, pursue the uh, clinical, the counseling uh, pathway uh, specifically. Um, I think the most important thing to understand here is that uh, uh, whether you are a you know, any sort of a mental health professional, I'll, I'll use that term mental health professional. Uh, it's a more of an umbrella term uh, when I do that. And uh, we know that under that, uh, we have different individuals uh, forming that bracket uh, from social workers uh, to uh, psychiatric nurses, to uh, psychiatrists, um, psychologists, counselors, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, for all of these individuals, specifically, I, because I'm a clinical psychologist, I'd like to focus on that aspect and also the counselor perspective. Uh, I think it's absolutely important and pivotal to have uh, the supervision aspect. Um, I think that's very important uh, because even any good uh, clinical program, any good uh, counseling program, uh, even for your registration purposes, uh, you require that uh, supervision hours, clinical hours, supervised numbers. So the supervision should not stop there. 
um, so we all should have a supervisor, a, a most senior individual who we uh, uh, need to talk to, who we need to discuss things, who we need as a mentor in our life. And uh, even at a professional level, uh, it's very it's very customary and it's very uh, normal in uh, in uh, developed countries like uh, Australia, Canada, UK, uh, the United States probably has a bit of a different structure, but they do have supervision as well uh, for even for the uh, professional. And uh, Naren mentioned about support groups as well. So uh, of course we can create those uh, at a professional level um, with uh, colleagues with other mental health professionals uh, where we uh, engage uh, in um, uh, discussions that helps to uh, uh, overcome the own difficulties that we go through because at the end of the day no matter uh, what sort of a, a, a mental health professional you are uh, you are still a human being so therefore uh, it's very important to recognize this fact uh, of course uh, a mental health professional because of their training uh, because of their clinical training, their uh, you know other uh, the learning, the education aspect might have a little bit more insight, knowledge, uh, and things uh, than the uh, average individual. But uh, that doesn't mean uh, that uh, yeah, stress and the, you know other inevitable things gonna uh, uh, impact us in a different manner. It does impact the same way. It's just that we might have a more better safety net uh, uh, in order to safeguard ourselves. And I think I need to mention the concept of boundaries. That's extremely important. You know, it, uh, just like uh, you have the boundaries in the therapeutic context, I think boundaries are very important. And the concept of mindfulness, that's very important, where you leave your job once you go home. Uh, so it's part of the practice. It's, it's, a, it's a practice. It's, it's the practice you get during your clinical training. So you learn not to take the problems home. And, and also, uh, it's please understand that as a psychologist, as a counselor, you probably can't be seeing 52, 53 clients a day like a medical doctor would. It's just not possible. You know, it's just not possible. And uh, because you can't give five minutes or 10 minutes per client, it's just uh, unethical as well uh, for us in our field. Because a lot of the uh, misunderstanding is that a lot of individuals try to compare a psychologist to a psychiatrist or a medical doctor. It's completely different fields. So different fields demands uh, diff uh, different uh, uh, agendas, different uh, job roles. So therefore, uh, it's very important to know that concept of boundary, even if you are working with five or even two individuals a day in terms of clients uh, that can still take a significant mental toll on you because uh, no one is coming here to uh, you know uh, talk happy things most of the time uh, it's mostly problems difficulties issues so it's very important to be professional uh, the, the boundaries are a part of professionalism and also very important that you be in the present uh, you don't take those problems back home or to anyone else apart from a supervisor that you have a more senior individual or uh, your support group in terms of your colleagues it's common it's common where we discuss problems uh, uh, that we face as individuals within a professional standard and boundary and uh, uh, coming back to uh, your question Naren, it's absolutely absolutely important uh, that you identify these you identify these aspects and you put that into practice uh, frequently and not like go for a, a, a supervisory session once a year that's not enough you know <laughs> so for me personally uh, I, I would have that once a month you know that uh, discussion and uh, my, my, my supervisor uh, is an uh, elderly individual uh, with a lot of experience so uh, it's, it's always that like a little safe place where you go and talk to uh, him and say you know I, I've had these sort of uh, clients and um, this is what I'm feeling you get a little bit of there uh, of course keeping the confidentiality in check and uh, maintaining the ethics and uh, like I said, anyone, any student, uh, that is also something to check in your in your programs that you're gonna do. So if it's clinical counseling, definitely your program will have uh, supervisors, will have the supervisory aspect, will have internship aspects. So those are not there just to you know fulfill the student's need. 
it is actually very very important as a professional for you to grow and uh, you need to make use of those and uh, of course uh, even at deep heaven we do provide those uh, avenues we do provide one to one uh, internship opportunities we do uh, provide opportunities for personal growth uh, for the students so uh, whether it's in sri lanka or whether it's outside of the country it's very important uh, that you have these uh, uh, things in line uh, specifically for your aspect because otherwise you as a human being could end up in uh, uh, in uh, burnout uh, in stress in difficulties because don't forget no matter uh, uh, how good a practitioner no matter how good a therapist or a counselor or a psychologist you are you are a human being at the end of the day uh, so it's very very important that you recognize this and uh, form the appropriate boundaries uh, and work accordingly so i hope uh, some of the students if if you are hoping to get into this area get into this field uh, i hope uh, you got a good message on that and of course i'm talking from my personal experience so it's very important to uh, recognize uh, those factors thank you very much janika i think that actually you know said another good thing as well now uh, we do different types of therapies and different types of therapy models are available and all that as well and then uh, part of the reason why i do hypnotherapy for instance is because when i do that on the client it it kind of you know makes me relaxed and you know focused as well so it has a bit of a effect just like that so as we were focusing on this particular question and uh, as we uh, understood what janaka was saying so let me uh, push the same question to mr ali as well for me to just to get an understanding about uh, how important these kind of support groups and all that are for therapists fine uh, thank you uh, i think it's yes it's very very important that like mr janaka said very very important to get perspective on uh, uh, your your sessions and your clients i, I think it, there is a very uh, it's it's a very important need because uh, in psychology there is no cut and dry answer like you have with the medicine you have symptom a here's the medicine symptom a it's not that simple it's because it's dealing with a human mind there is much more complexity to it so when it comes to uh, the same issue you might have different roots and different parts and different approaches that you can address and for certain individuals one approach would be effective uh, whereas another individual the same issue would be a completely different reason behind it plus a different approach would be uh, a different approach would actually work for that individual so to get that experience in perspective like mr janaka said it's very important to have a supervisor who can actually guide you uh, not just during the time during your internship but even throughout throughout your career actually uh, even if you say uh, even if you are a very senior person i would say at the very least have peers have peers who actually can give you perspective sometimes we are we are all human beings we sometimes miss things and just as uh, uh, having that discussion with another person even if the other person doesn't give you the uh, give you the perspective just discussing it will actually give you perspective sometimes and make you realize oh, hang on a second i haven't thought about this element or um, or so on and so forth so that that could actually give help you in your reflection so to speak um in addition to that i would actually say uh, in 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 business in uh, business side uh, in organizations there's this concept called 360 feedback so in for therapists as well i think it's important i i mean uh, kind of exploring the idea of getting feedback not just from a person who is senior to to you and not just from a person who is parallel or a peer but also from someone who is just new to the uh, to the field that those people also will be able to give you quite a bit of perspective and uh, the different stakeholders for example the client uh, the client's family members like mr darren you mentioned quite early on uh, about the client who had uh, uh, the mother who had the issue first and then the daughter who had come for counseling because of the impact her mother's uh, situation put her in so you you have to understand there are different stakeholders when it comes to a, a a client it's not just a client individually you have to look at it from the 
people who are around them and who get affected by that, those people as well. And not just the immediate family or the extended family, but also from different settings, for example, workplace setting. The impact that uh, this, this mental well being or the psychological well being or the, the issues that the person is having with their, their, themselves can have an impact in the workplace as well. And the impact on the workplace is usually, especially in Sri Lanka, not um, understood or accepted. It doesn't matter what you're going through, leave whatever is your personal stuff at home and come to work, much like what you, the opposite of what Mr. Janaka said. Uh, when you leave your work, you need to make sure you leave the issues from your workplace back at your work and come home the, to reduce your stress so that you don't carry all that burden with you when you come in. So the same applies to the other way around. Your burdens that you have in your life, you shouldn't be carrying to your work. But in reality, sometimes it's not as cut and dry as that. It's a bit, it's a bit difficult. Um, those issues will do will will actually manifest and it will, will be seen in your workplace, especially if the issues, the degree of those issues are quite severe. So yes, it is very important. Coming back to the point that you are asking specifically, support groups are important, supervision is important, but not just that. Um, you need to have continual uh, updates or, or continual knowledge that you need to see. What is the improvements or what is the current understanding in this field? And there is, as you can, as you probably know already, a lot of the participants, there is significant improvements, significant uh, knowledge that's gained from um, uh, from the fields, the, the different fields. There's a lot of research being done, especially now with the new uh, the, the new normal, so to speak, with the COVID pandemic. How has that impacted? There's a lot of knowledge uh, that is, there's a lot of research coming in, and all of that will actually help inform you and make a much more um, holistic approach to um, your therapy. Thank you very much, Ali. <clears throat> I think with that, you know, uh, what I was thinking is that now, uh, being a psychologist and being an educator, uh, it feels like, you know, most of the time that there's a very rewarding career. It, it's rewarding. And the more you feel it is rewarding, the busier you usually get. And you probably might know that uh, weekends, all of us are pretty much packed, which means you have to teach multiple classes. So sometimes, you know, every Saturday, it's eight hours of teaching. Sunday would be another eight hours of teaching. And then weekdays you have classes to teach, but on top of that, you have clients. If you have your own organization for counseling, then you have to run the organization. You have to do your studies. And it's not just, you know, doing one hour of counseling and it doesn't end like that because we had to maintain the reports. And at DHC, something that all of our staff maintains is, you know, clear record of, you know, information like of, uh, what exactly the person went through and all that. And then these things need to be well regulated and planned, which means there needs to be significant amount of effort because we are considering what the client is going through over the week. So it's just that the person will be coming in one of the days in a given week, and then the person will be coming again in the next week. But in the meantime, there is a associated process in between, which is something that we would have to do. And this obviously makes us much more busier, and it also gets us to you know have less time for ourselves especially when you're sacrificing your weekend and the weekdays as well. So sometimes the biggest question is, in what particular day of a month am I going to get a leave for myself? So do you think, Mr. Janaker, that these kind of problems are unique to our profession? Oh, apart from ones that I have mentioned, do you think there are unique problems that our professionals are dealing in, in this mental health uh, realm? Well, it's definitely uh, part and parcel of what you mentioned, yeah, and, and uh, uh, I think uh, that's where these programs, uh, especially the, uh, where it doesn't matter whether it's a bachelor's degree or whether it's uh, in any other uh, level of qualification, these things need to be properly communicated to, to students because sometimes it's like the undergraduate psychology, people sometimes think of students uh, or parents would probably think, oh, psychology, not hard science. Uh, you know, my kid can just uh, skim through. There's no math involved. Then you think know, those misconceptions. And then the moment you come to your uh, second year, sometimes you have a whole bunch of statistics. And then 
uh, if you go into honors program, you have advanced statistics, research methods, and you're like, oh, I thought there's no maths. So, you know, that sort of misconceptions uh, uh, needs to be, I think, uh, uh, minimized uh, with proper uh, information, uh, with proper understanding, uh, with uh, good, adequate uh, knowledge about what is expected. I think these problems can be minimized, uh, Nare. But like you mentioned, um, in this field, we play multiple roles. I think I need to mention that a um, uh, uh, lot of things are uh, happening simultaneously. Uh, uh, we can be uh, a psychologist, uh, a lecturer, uh, a researcher, uh, educator, uh, a mentor. So, uh, and that is just the professional life. And then you have your personal life. So, how do you balance that? Uh, you very correctly mentioned the weekends. I think I honestly cannot remember the, uh, you know, the last time I had both sun Sunday and Saturday off. I really can't remember. You know, my memory is quite decent, uh, but but honestly, I cannot remember. So that's something that you have to gear up. You know, that's something you have to gear up. Uh, and also, don't forget, there's a helping profession. So you cannot only do things for you. You need to be there for the person. You need to be there for the client, of course, within uh, ethical boundaries. That's a very important part. Also, uh, understand the proper mechanisms, the proper dynamic that this profession brings. And I think that is where student needs to be, a lot of the time needs to be equipped with proper knowledge. I like it sometimes, honestly, uh, when I was an undergraduate, uh, when I opened my introductory psychology uh, textbook, I still remember it to now, uh, I was reading about different types of psychologists like developmental, organizational psychologists, clinical psychologists. Of course, I had no, uh, you know, no uh, idea at that point where I may have ended up in, although my primary interest was in clinical psychology, I wanted to do neuropsychology. And then when I got to know that it's another eight to 10 years of uh, new training after your bachelor's, I was like, mm, I need to reassess my life. So, you know, like that, you need to get that knowledge. At one point, I remember in my first year, I wanted to get into sports psychology. And then it's, it's, it's an extremely diverse field, extremely diverse field. And uh, I think that is where the knowledge is very important for the students. Like I said, it doesn't matter which level you are in education. You can be a diploma student, you can be a higher HND, bachelor's, master's. Even the PhDs, the doctorate students need to be explained. You know, you get that doctoral training. It's not just your 75,000 word thesis. It's the uh, character building that happens. And I think that is what needs to be targeted at these programs, especially for a, 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 a profession, a job like this, just like medicine. A lot of the individuals know that medical degrees are tedious, uh, they are difficult, uh, you need to sacrifice your own life, and those are the uh, bits and pieces of knowledge that you need to give to uh, everyone, uh, the, the insight, the understanding. Otherwise, people uh, very falsely in the Sri Lankan context, or Asia for that matter, think that, oh, with a bachelor's degree, I can become a psychologist. I'm done now, am I a psychologist? that sort of thing. So that is where you need to bring in regulations. You need to bring in clinical training if you are in that pathway or uh, the other frameworks that is there. I think uh, from my knowledge, one of the uh, uh, best countries which has this at the policy level is uh, Australia uh, because their, their, their pathway to practice is not too difficult to be honest. You do require a master's degree and uh, several years of experience. Uh, but they have a very, uh, I would say, a flexible structure uh, for psychology uh, because that country needs a lot of people, not like Sri Lanka doesn't need, we definitely need, and we do not have uh, enough professionals, uh, but it's just that the framework, the, the policies, uh, which Naren mentioned in the very beginning, uh, the regulatory aspect that is missing in our country and also the ethical aspect which is missing. So these are things which we are slowly working on 
as professionals, uh, but but because of certain uh, underpinnings, because of certain uh, uh, things that are not in line in Sri Lanka, uh, some of these things may be difficult to bring to the standard of other foreign countries. Because if the US, for example, has regulations uh, for different states, uh, you may be a psychologist in Massachusetts, for example, but may not be able to practice in uh, um, Oregon. For example, I'm just giving an example. So, so they do have those, and that is the you know, the policies, the regulations. We need to be there, not there just for the namesake, but for individuals' awareness and understanding. And that should start from the student, because they're the one who is going forward. They're the one who needs to strike that balance. And just making a rosy picture wouldn't necessarily allow them to uh, understand the demands of the job. And uh, as you all correctly know, uh, psychology is a very, very popular field. Uh, it's extremely popular. It's uh, extremely rewarding. Uh, but, but you need to understand both sides of the coin, uh, the positive side as well as the negative aspect. And when you do that, uh, you try your level best as an individual to uh, strike a balance. And uh, of course, with things like experience, uh, your, uh, as you age, your experience, your knowledge, we, we need to constantly learn. Uh, I do programs online, we go for training programs, we do training programs, so it's a simultaneous process. Uh, it's always about the personal growth. And uh, uh, for this profession, that's a never ending process. And if you are ready uh, to do that, I think uh, getting that proper understanding and knowledge uh, definitely there's a very, very fine pathway ahead, uh, but you need to have that commitment uh, to move forward. Thank you very much, Janaka. So with that, let me ask the same question for Mr. Ali once again. So uh, in your opinion, what do you think are the common problems the therapists go through these days? Uh, if I may ask, uh, in your opinion, what do you think about that? Actually, I'd say they are human beings. They go through the same issues that everybody else does. They, go, they have depression, they have anxiety, they have stress. And like what Mr. Janaka rightly mentioned, we are also overwhelmed. So it's very important that we need to take care of our mental health as well. And because we are seen as uh, counselors and mental health professionals, sometimes um, we are expected to be able to take care of ourselves. We are seen as a person who are much more aware of uh, our own mental well-being. While that may be true, there are, there are times when uh, we'll need to seek um, support from uh, another professional. Because you have to understand, uh, despite being, us being professionals, just like any client, um, when there are uh, serious issues, uh, we would require uh, a professional intervention because we can't be 100% objective because we are too close to the issue. So, for example, if uh, I've had a serious loss uh, in the family, so I'm going through grievance. While I'm aware of how to deal with it, a professional guiding me through it would definitely uh, help. So being in, in the current situation, now we are going through COVID uh, issues. If someone, a therapist had lost a loved one, say for example, a spouse to COVID, God, God forbid, uh, that would have a really, really big impact because uh, I'm sure you would know all of you know how severe and how frustrating and how much suffering the people who go through COVID go through. So that would have a really big impact on the therapist. And when the person is going through that much of trauma, uh, remembering uh, their spouse going through all those difficulties, it, you would need uh, psychological intervention. Not just from, it doesn't need to be necessarily from a therapist, but at least a support structure. As a psychologist or a therapist, you would be more uh, aware of uh, your own self and you would be able to determine much more effectively if you would need uh, support. So this is just an example. Yes, it is uh, important 
that uh, you you get support as well. But in addition to that, I also want to say um, one of the biggest issues that uh, therapists go through is uh, being objective. Uh, one that is actually rarely focused on uh, biases. We all have our biases and it's understandable that we need to uh, uh, minimize that when we are actually dealing with the clients, but minimize the influence of the bias. But uh, it also goes into the ethical realm there. Uh, but can we actually truly be 100% objective and um, disregard all bias? In reality, that's not going to be the case. You are going to be biased, but the thing is, can you actually manage that and make sure it doesn't influence your interaction with the client and your feedback and guidance that you're providing to the client? That is the key question. If you ever see yourself breaching that, um, if you see your biases staying more, then you have an ethical obligation to inform them. This is this, I believe, is one of the most uh, the biggest issues that we have to deal with. Yeah, thank you very much, Ali. So, with that, uh, let me ask this question now. One of the things that we uh, usually see quite a lot is that you know. Uh, our youngsters are very much you know, active in terms of promoting mental health. And we have support groups for individuals who are dealing with suicide kind of issues. We have uh, youngsters who are directly working with improving the physical health of individuals and how that would translate into mental health and all that as well. But regardless of how much the youngsters put effort, it seems like the policymakers and the elder generation is kind of stuck. So, let me ask you, you know, your opinion on this, because uh, the reason why I'm asking this one is because now, uh, as we have already understood, psychology in itself has become multifaceted. And right now, there is some sort of regulations for clinical psychology, like what exactly makes someone a clinical psychologist in Sri Lanka. But as an educator and as a person who is not a clinical psychologist, but you know, I'm a psychologist who's interested in education and in teaching people and all that, there is no such regulatory body. There is no such you know, uh, uh, government agency that could guide people. So my, my question is why the, the Sri Lankan policymakers are stuck and why exactly they are not doing anything. So I'll first uh, ask this question from Mr. Janak and then we can ask from Mr. Ali the same question as well. So Mr. Janak, what do you think about this? Um, Narin, I'll, I'll have to give a very, very uh, bitter answer to that. I think uh, it's it's perhaps it's it's a combination of, you You see what's happening in the country. Uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very unfortunate situation where uh, uh, the right thing not being done at the right time. So uh, until very recently, we had a, a mental health act, uh, which was, I think, passed uh, in, the, in the early 20th century. Uh, so uh, a country cannot move forward uh, unless uh, the, the uh, leaders, uh, the, the governance uh, is looking at uh, it in a very positive direction. So uh, Sri Lanka, unfortunately, uh, have not had uh, that that uh, political backup. Uh, it's not a topic I really like to talk about, but I need to bring that in since you ask about policies. Uh, haven't really had that uh, backup. Uh, haven't really had that regulatory aspect. Uh, you were very correct in telling that clinical psychology is the only regulatory uh, aspect currently. Yep, we have seen that. We have been there. Uh, um, primarily because uh, I think uh, in Sri Lanka, of course, because of the lack of understanding and because psychology was quite a new field, um, you know, until about the early 2000s. Uh, but uh, even after that, you know, uh, could ask the question, what really happened in the next 20 years? So uh, I would give a very simple answer to this. Uh, the, the biggest problem is the lack of collaboration, uh, lack of uh, uh, acceptance uh, that we have a problem. And uh, same things apply to as why Sri Lanka never grows as a nation. So uh, we, we have, uh, you know, very, very uh, uh, minute uh, ways of looking at things, uh, very uh, short-sighted ways of looking at things. And no country that is 
developed, no country that is uh, moving forward uh, ever ever go there uh, with short sightedness. You need to have, of course, you need to have short term plans. You need to have long term plans because the long term plan, the goal is what gives you the avenue to have those little targets to reach. And uh, uh, what we do is we just blindly follow certain things or. Uh, get some sort of a thing from uh, the, the the other aspects of other countries, uh, but not really having a vision for ourselves. So uh, coming back to that question, uh, the lack of collaboration, the la lack of uh, governance support, and the uh, the backup uh, that has led to uh, psychology being uh, an area that is not being recognized, an uh, area that's not being given its due place, and uh, so, uh, an area where people are suffering as a result, and uh, um, that needs to see, change soon uh, rather than later. Thank you very much, Janaka. So uh, let me ask the same question from Mr. Ali as well. So what do you think about uh, uh, what we were just you know discussing here in terms of getting other uh, aspects of uh, psychology also to be regulated thank you Ryan. um so actually i would say the what well, i agree 100 percent with everything that uh, Ms. janaka said and i would like to actually add a little bit to that and uh, um, in addition to not accepting the issues that are there, there is also another additional factor. If you consider the point, who are the primary lobbyists? Or, um, who are the, first, the question is, who are the policy makers? That's the government and uh, the, 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 the uh, ministers and the parliament and except so on and so forth. But if you consider who are the lobbyists in this, or the, who are the main stakeholders and lobbyists in terms of policy making for psychology? I would say currently, right now, there is, it's the medical profession, the medical doctors. Uh, this is again another uh, a bit of truth that uh, a lot of people don't want to talk about or don't want to actually accept. Um, but we are currently going through the same thing that was happening in the 1970s in UK. It was uh, essentially uh, uh, the question of who actually should be addressing uh, psychological issues. And right now, uh, there's a lack of understanding of what a psychologist does um, um, properly, because the way they see these issues, they see it as, it's a, a psych as a psychiatrist can actually address them. But there's a drastic difference between what a psychiatrist does and what a psychologist does. Um, and this usually when it comes to uh, psych uh, uh, lobbyists in, in the, the field in terms of policy making, it's driven by the medical professions. And the medical the psychiatrists and other medical practitioners see this as a direct uh, competition. Uh, but in actual, in reality, I would say it's not actually a competition. We are actually uh, two different complementary uh, therapeutic approaches. Yes, there needs to be uh, medical intervention in certain situations where uh, therapy, sorry, uh, counselor would not be the most effective. That's very true. But likewise, for a much uh, less severe uh, uh, issue or, for example, um, a non-medical intervention required issue, the psych a psychologist is the best uh, uh, person. Because if you think about it from uh, a, a practical application perspective, if you go to a, a doctor, they usually spend about 15 minutes. They don't spend much more than that in uh, diagnosing a, a, a client. Uh, whereas when it comes to uh, psychology and therapy, you need to spend at least uh, one hour in a session and multiple sessions before you can actually start addressing the issue. Because when it comes to the human mind, it's much more complex and uh, even the client might not be aware of what the, uh, the root issue is that's causing these issues and that's causing the psychological problem. So getting to that would take some time. Sometimes in some instances, it's uh, lifelong therapy. And having said that, uh, someone actually asked the question, uh, have there been approaches made to actually uh, talk to policymakers? Yes, there have been. Quite a lot of people have from the psychological community approached them, but there's two issues there. One, we don't have much political power uh, in who we are at the moment uh, as a group, and there's not much unity. There's a lot of uh, um, separation. It's uh, the competition is actually driving 
separation between the different psych psychologists. So what I say is we need to actually come together to actually um, try and actually rectify these issues, um, address this at a um, national level and actually work towards finding a solution. Whereas we are uh, splintered at the moment and the strength will come when we do that. And uh, as Mr. Narayan mentioned, the only uh, field that is actually regulated and managed is the clinical psychologist. Uh, and even that is un comes under the medical council. So that essentially goes back to what I was saying earlier. It's uh, not just the issue of understanding and acceptance, but it's also a much bigger issue. They see it as uh, a competitor coming into the field and taking away uh, jobs from them. So we need to work on changing that attitude and actually um, seeing it as a beneficial, uh, productive relationship, a symbiotic relationship, if you may, uh, with the medical field in, in terms of addressing this. I'm pretty sure um, if you look at it from a, a, a classification point of view, even clinical psychologists are currently classified as uh, support staff. Uh, so that is actually 100% incorrect. They're actually in a properly trained, uh, fully uh, licensed psychologist in any other country in the Western world is actually equivalent to the medical professional. So uh, to a doctor, for example, a specialist doctor. So we need to come to that stage where there is acceptance and understanding of the psychology profession. And we still have quite a lot of work to do to that, to, on that regard. Thank you very much, Ali. So I think uh, we have had a very fruitful discussion today. So we just started with the basic uh, psychological problems in the society. Then we discussed about the education aspects, and then we discussed about the practitioner, and then we also discussed about some of the uh, policy aspects, and also uh, a bit about uh, how psychology needs to be further transformed, and how these courses need to be further streamlined to uh, kind of stay on par with the Western world. So I think uh, the, the real challenge here would be bringing all of the things that we have discussed into fruition. So which is something that we would have to keep on uh, pushing ourselves. So uh, I would like to take this time to thank uh, all the participants and for your enthusiasm in taking part in this to have this discussion on uh, uh, coming uh, together with us to understand more about the existing issues in the field and how these things could be addressed. But at the same time, uh, uh, taking this message forward within your own communities and in, within your own friend circles and all that as well, because that's exactly one of the ways of raising awareness about uh, why this field is important and what kind of benefits it may bring and it may incur uh, towards you know, the, the, the society. So uh, those are things that uh, we would have to do in, in the days to come. So I would like to take this time to thank both our experts, uh, uh, Mr. Ali and also Mr. Janaka. So I think uh, we have reached the end of uh, the first session. So we'll be again beginning the second session as well. So as we uh, uh, wind up, uh, sorry, uh, close this uh, particular session, I would like to ask whether Mr. Ali or Mr. Janaka uh, have anything to you know add uh, to uh, what we have you know discussed? I think uh, with regards to the uh, aspect of the uh, World Mental Health Day, uh, it's great if uh, that all the participants here gathered something new, you know, in terms of the discussions that we've had. Uh, that's the uh, you know the main aim. That's what we want uh, to give more clarity and uh, uh, you know help everyone uh, to be a better version of themselves uh, moving forward. Yeah, I think uh, I agree. Um, this is. A very good initiative by the Chairman Council, Mr. Narin. So thank you very much for the opportunity. And also, I think yeah, if uh, the participants can have taken something back from this, I think it would be very, very beneficial. And um, if you have any clarifying questions, I think Mr. Narin would be okay if you had if you asked them as well. So yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, so we have a couple of minutes. If you have any. Uh, 
uh, questions and uh, feel free to drop them in the chat box. Uh, yeah. And uh, with that, I also want to say that uh, we'll be starting uh, the next session uh, where uh, other allied professionals would be coming to speak about mental health at 2.30. So uh, we'll be keeping the call just like this. Uh, so the participants would be joining at 2.30 and we'll be starting that at 2.30 and I will be moderating the entire session and we would be having a, a medical doctor and a, a special ed teacher and a psychologist and also a, a microbiologist and all. So. Um, Feel free to participate uh, on that as well. So it's, it starts at 2.30 and go uh, until the uh, 4.30. So once again, I would like to take this time to thank all of you and uh, uh, for your enthusiasm and also uh, uh, assisting us uh, to take this message forward. So thank you very much. And uh, so that's it uh, from my end. So I shall see you again at uh, 2.30 in, in the uh, next session. So yes, we have one question as well. Yes, so let me quickly address that. So there's a trend of graduates moving out of the country of postgraduate studies. Probably subsequently they would find their careers in foreign countries. Yes, I think to retain the talent, pool, this is something that I have been discussing about the uh, myself and Mr. Arya. We are very involved with uh, the tertiary vocation education commission. So the programs are edit. Uh, Education-wise, most of the programs are okay. They require they, they meet the standards, but the problem is who is regulating the subject. There needs to be a body that actually manages the subject of psychology. So until there is such a regulatory body available in Sri Lanka, this won't be a possibility. So when I ask how exactly to do that, there needs to be a group of psychologists who would have to lobby and get an act passed from the parliament so that you know we could start regulating and that would be the basic process but the real question is you know considering the efficiency of this country how much of time will it take to really get the parliamentary act passed so that we could become a regulatory body because to regulate education psychology counseling psychology and other forms of psychology so there needs to be a psychology regulatory body regulatory body for just psychologists uh, without you know any other external party intervention with vested interest other than psychology so i think that would be the key step in retaining the talent getting individuals to understand that sri lanka can produce better individuals because we see psychologists who are going abroad, learning and working abroad. So if they can work abroad, which means they can work here as well. But the question is, why would anyone come when the country doesn't recognize you on par with you know, other professionals? So that's the bigger question. And that's exactly what we are trying to change. I know we are a smaller organization. So compared to bigger uh, groups in other professions, we are a very small group. But end of the day, if we really think about making that difference, the only thing that we could do is to set aside the differences we may share and consider the differences as a key uh, uh, you know, thing that encourages us. We see it as an asset and moving forward with creating these kind of things. So through that only we could make a long lasting difference. So a difference that would continue to perpetuate it. If not, what happens is, you know, we'll be like dividing and fighting, you know, which is something uh, not super, you know, uncommon in Sri Lanka as well, to be very honest. So I think that 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 mindset we have to uh, change, and uh, so we'll uh, try to implement these kind of things so that as a collective of professionals, the voice would definitely be heard. So that's the thing that I wanted to add. So with that, I would like to end the, the session. So thank you very much. And uh, we shall see you again at uh, 2.30. So I'll keep the call just like this and we'll see you at uh, 2.30. Thank you very much.